Hello everyone, thank you for coming. My name is John Connell. I am the Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Clean Air. Uh, I want to welcome everyone. We are here today to learn a little bit about some of the regulations, mostly in the city of Chicago, and how Clean Air and Aeroqual, our channel partner, uh, can help combat that, if you will. Um, I want to thank everybody for attending, both in person, we have a nice crowd here. We also have a live streaming audience on our YouTube channel. For you people on YouTube, you can zoom in on the screens if you would wish to as we go on. I especially want to thank our presenters who I'll introduce as they come up. Um, we, have, we, think we have a pretty good presentation this morning. This afternoon will not be live streamed and that will be hands-on training with the equipment itself. Uh, most of you already know, but the restrooms are upstairs behind us. Should there be an emergency where we have to evacuate, we will go out to the left. With that, I'm gonna introduce Michael Enos from the city of Chicago, and he is going to present some overviews of the regulations for the city. Let's go, guys. Um, okay, how do I advance the slide? That's the only question that I have. Uh, you can hit the button, or you can do this. So we wanna do, you wanna use the, your phone? All right, that looks familiar. How's it going? I am, my name is Mike, let's get started. That's my title. Okay, so we are going to go over to current regulations, new policies that we're, we're enacting, and some future trends. Um, so the current regulations, uh, so these are some of our bigger dust emitting sites that we have operating within our city limits, which is where our jurisdiction is. Um, for example, bulk storage materials. Um, an example of that would be a lot of what's on the southeast side near Lake Calumet. There's, a, there's quite a few of those down there. Um, demolitions by implosions, we'll cover one of those. Uh, large recycling facilities and reprocessable construction and demolition material facilities. What does that mean to you? Basically concrete crushing into uh, road building materials. Okay, bulk storage materials. Um, this is one of the ones that is currently enacted and we've got some experience with regulating these facilities under these rules. So if you'll notice, this is a facility. It no longer looks like that, thankfully. Near this facility, you would have events like this um, under high winds where, I mean, not only is this a particulate matter problem in terms of uh, concentration, but that would actually fail opacity. I mean, you can't read it off a picture, but I'm guessing. So the current rules for this uh, require a fugitive dust plan. That includes a MET station and four PM10 monitors at the compass points. What you need to know about these PM10 monitors is that in this particular rule set, they are specified as federal equivalent method, right? Um, one of the issues we've had specifying these monitors is that it costs the facilities a lot of money to, to run power to these monitors because I guess they take a lot of power with, um, with all the you guys know better than, than I do what the power requirements are for these um, federal equivalent monitors. So we're learning. Um, the facilities set a reportable action limit. Normally we would just uh, accept um, 150 micrograms per cubic meter. Um, and how do you respond when the monitor, uh, how do you respond when the monitor does uh, fire off like that? at that um, level because a lot of times you know a lot of the responses we get is well it's off-site and in many cases it's true um, there is some uh, monthly reporting in this case that would be emails with uh, spreadsheets we would like to um, we would like to get we would like to get it directly into our uh, into into our servers so that they can that data can be digested a little bit better and we're going to go into that in, uh, in later slides uh, so if you happen to have uh, if you happen to be storing pet coke 
these rules require you to enclose the pet coke. If you happen to be storing manganese bearing bulk materials, there is no minimum level of manganese specified in the rules, but the main concern we have is about manganese or ferromanganese and silicomanganese. There's a rule section, rule number five, that not only does it have to be enclosed, it has to be like doors and uh, filtered exhaust with negative pressure. So that's, and then in that case, there's a federal reference monitor that also needs to be, um, that also needs to be installed. And those report every three days with the filter-based monitoring showing particulate, manganese, et cetera. Okay, large recycling facilities. Some of you, some of you may recognize this large recycling facility. Um, what, makes a, what makes a facility large? Well, it's about this big, that's not really. It is 1,000 tons per day or shredding 25 tons per hour. So that's large. And there's also another one, a con consequential facility, which your sweat your, has other requirements. The 25 tons per hour of shredding is, is one of those as well. So they're pretty similar in terms of what their requirements are. Uh, they require a fugitive dust plan. Um, in this case, we're not, this is where we've made some changes. We're not requiring the FEM. We are, we're using, we, you can also use INSIM near, near reference, I think. You guys know what INSIM stands for, right? Okay, because I forget. Um, here, the reportable action limit is set by the rule, same monthly reporting requirements. Um, if you'll notice, uh, the, Met, the Met One Instrument e-sampler, that is the one that is currently what all the facilities in Chicago are using. I know Aeroqual's here, and that's not an Aeroqual. That's just what they've chosen, right? So if I go back, for example, the BAM 120 is what um, the, all of the bulk material storage facilities are using. So if you see, you can also have one to eight. I think the most we have right now uh, for a recycling facility currently in operation is five. And I think it's just due to the dispersion modeling and how far the residences are from where this facility is. All right, does anybody recognize this? Have you seen it in the news? Everybody know what happened here. Smokestack was brought down sideways and didn't look like they did enough uh, pre-wetting dust mitigation and whatnot, and this is what you get. Okay, so we have rules enacted in 2021. Luckily, we haven't had any implosion since then to test the viability of these rules. Um, these also require a dust monitoring plan with the weather station, minimum of two upwind and downwind. Um, and likewise, we're doing a FEM or indicative near reference monitors. The point being, you need to see where, where it went and where it's going, in terms of where it was and where it's going, the, uh, the dust level. Um, Likewise, there, I think this is gonna be federal reference monitoring uh, daily and then the establishment of uh, background levels and proof that they've returned to background after the implosion. Because a lot of times what you'll have is the dust gets dispersed, maybe there was wetting, right? The wet mud that was kicked up by the, uh, by the implosion would dry out and then the vehicles are driving over it and kicking up everything that, uh, that was released from the from the implosion. <sighs> this is the permanent rock crushing, right? So again, it's a long title. It equates to turning large pieces of concrete into smaller pieces of concrete that meet federal and state specifications for road materials or uh, transportation materials. You see here's your large pieces of concrete that are getting reprocessed. So you're seeing a pattern here. You need a dust monitoring plan for everything. Uh, weather station, this is, this is gonna go pretty similar to how we, do the, um, how we do the recycling facilities, right? One to eight uh, federal equivalent methods, so you don't have to run an FEM. You guys let me know. It's, it's, 
the FEMs require a lot more power than these near reference monitors, right? Yeah, so you can you can deploy those remotely with solar panels and batteries, right? With some and with some backup power, right? That's going to be huge for your facility infrastructure costs. So that's kind of where, and we're moving to that. Um, can you guys tell me in the room? Do you get quicker readings from the near reference monitors than you do from the FEMs? That's another thing because we're not necessarily regulating on directly on the readings like as though it were a NAC standard. It would be more that we're requiring a response that we're gonna say this is, if you don't do that in response to this near reference but not regulatable uh, monitoring, if you don't do take the appropriate steps, then we get involved and start issuing notices of violation and things like that. As you can see, it's the same 150 uh, micrograms per cubic meter, um, and we're looking for uh, we're looking for reporting to our environmental software, which I'll get into later on. Uh, as you can see here, this has been highlighted by Renate. So I'm going to say you probably know more about this being the manufacturer, manufacturer's reps. This is uh, what we're looking for, and it looks like things got kind of cut off here. Um, yeah, so there's a link to the uh, SCA QMD, the Southern California rules. Um, where's your, the dust sentry, that's one. Um, what you need to know basically is that, that they have done the research to determine the suitability of the dust uh, controls, right? So if you roll out with if you roll out with a deployment of purple airs, we're going to say, "Cool, man, where is this purple air in the uh, SCA QMD standards?" Right? Oh, I'm sorry, it's not there. Well, then you have to go back and hey, call Clean Air; they'll they'll hook you up. We can't say your name, but call a consultant such as Clean Air and these others and order air monitors such as. Aeropol Dust Sentry and others, for example. And yeah, it's the same thing. So this was this was broken in half. Okay, that's good. Um, same thing here. This is where this SCA QMD would, would have been said. All right. Environmentally complex demolitions. Okay, we're back in my territory. So I wrote I wrote this policy. Um, so what happens is when you go to get a demolition and wrecking permit in the city of Chicago, first you go to the Department of Buildings and there are a number of different departments that have to sign off, right? Some are pretty obvious, um, like sewers and gas, you know, because they have to cut off, and water, because they have to cut off the water supply to the building that's gonna get demolished or you'll have more watering than you signed up for. Um, rodent control, things like that, sewers, yeah, I said. Um, one of the sign-offs is us, the environment, and we just, for a basic demolition, right, um, you know, two, three flat, we're reviewing for asbestos inspection and dust, for, dust control requirements. And a lot of times just uh, watering is fine. You know, uh, a decent, a decent truck route that doesn't disturb your neighbors, things like that. Um, for some demolitions, big ones, um, like say a former lime plant would be a good example, which uh, happened recently. Um, we're gonna require additional, we're gonna require air monitoring as part of the dust control measures that are required in, this, in the ordinance section. So these, I'm gonna read you those. Now, we, I'm gonna, I am open to feedback on if this is adequate because what we want to do is just make sure that one, the community is uh, the community is protected, right? Um, so having the monitors up will encourage, will let the contractors who are doing the demolition know that I, I don't have a dust problem. And two, if someone's complaining about something that's not really an issue, the company can protect itself by saying, "I had a monitor here and I had a monitor here. Here's the difference in the monitors given the wind direction." Um, you can see that we had not enough of an effect to, to impact public health, right? So it goes both ways having the monitors. Uh, so I'm just gonna read it from my sheet because you can't read it here. Uh, you need 
you need two total monitors. My the AeroQual for the AeroQual monitor that I call out as equivalent would be the dust sentry. Is that one? That's one you guys make, right? Right. So that would be the one that we would like to see on site at a demolition where this is where this was required. One upwind and downwind. We have to know where it was when the readings were taken. Um, meteorology station, site and map showing showing those those fixed locations. So you wouldn't just be like, yeah, I put them both on one side and then demolish downwind of them. Yeah, that's not going to work. Um, and then they have to they have to respond when it's 100 micrograms per cubic meter, and they have an hour to get it to prevent to prevent their their hot monitor from going up to 150 micrograms per cubic meter and they got to let us know and write down what they did um, data collection and outage reporting they just email us hey my monitor went down yeah sure it did uh, this is yeah temporary rock crisis. so you see a lot of these this is um you see actually i think they, there are a lot of these at, at o'hare right yeah there's, this is where you're, um, you're, you're taking um, you're taking concrete from the dem from the demolition site, uh, crushing it and reusing it for fill at the demolition site. So if you can't meet these, so they don't by rule they don't require dust monitoring unless they don't meet the setback requirements. Then it is probably going to be more like probably going to be something like this it's the same it's the same level of dust monitoring all right recently in response to the implosion uh, the air quality or the air quality ordinance passed under the zoning uh, the zoning codes so we all sort of operate in our lanes for the most part um, the majority of our regulations um, with regard to air quality are 114600 to 810 and with regard to demolitions is 114270 um, zoning is a, is in a whole different section and it's uh, enforced in, in a kind of a different way like you can either build this or you can't before it, before anything even goes up so any of these type of any of these types of facilities are going to have to go through and we're going to have to go through air monitoring, uh, an air monitoring study, and depending on the results of the study, for example, if your air dispersion model says operating in a certain way will cause uh, hot readings at, at the park immediately to the northwest of you, for example, um, you're going to need to cite some air monitors to make sure that that's not going to happen or to make sure that what is happening isn't happening or what is said in the monitor <laughs> what is said by the by the modeling doesn't bear out and, and that you would be able to um, take appropriate measures if, if that were to happen so you'll notice a lot of uh, a lot of the foregoing things that we talked about where there's rules like the manganese bearing bulk material sites all of these are covered under regulations and class class five and probably four b's are, are generally going to tend to fall under the large recycling facility rules. Um, this has a zoning, uh, this intensive ma chemical manufacturing, for example, has a zoning definition that's pretty narrow. So you won't see a lot of those, I don't believe. All right. We are looking into, into do, and when we say future trends, we might need feedback from manufacturers such as AeroQual, Met1, people that know how to do take these measurements um, what we're looking at is uh, mo you know monitoring for um, I, you know Knox PM 2.5 noise monitoring that's a particular concern in the downtown area and near there where there's we're getting a lot of complaints about data centers refrigeration units and things like that you know odor recycling asphalt compost facilities and other um, VOCs, yeah, H2S, like you guys make sensors for all this stuff, right? And, and they're pretty accurate and we can say for certain that if if you can smell H2S, this thing will also smell H2S and record that H2S was smelt at that location. 
So this is, uh, this is our software system right now. We're using one called EnviroSuite. I think these, so these are some screens from that. Uh, Renante administers our EnviroSuite. And you can see here, um, I believe this location is on the Calumet River, or part of it anyway. And you, so we have local air monitors showing um, showing the uh, particulate concentration. I believe this is all PM10, or it could be PM2.5. It'd be nice if better resolution. Um, I will say that we know they're working because in that Canadian wildfire air event, these things were all orange and red. So like, well, at least you know. Um, and then this is our big project right now for environmental justice is the low-cost sensor network and where you guys come in with that is we might need to compare these low-cost sensor net readings with some of your more sophisticated instruments that we that we know have a guarantee of accuracy because if you're getting a bunch of junk readings that that, that it's not helping anybody so it, we would need to also set up every now and then near reference and um, equivalent monitors so this right now there's a UIC grant two million dollars Microsoft had, had originally planned on doing a community project um, where they were installing these low-cost sensors and they I think they backed out recently when they changed leadership or something so we're, we're gonna try to pick that up um, so you see these readings on the on the side here, that's those are from purple air sensors, right? So we would probably, you know, have to supplement that with, you know, pro grade instruments. Um, let's see. All right. Any questions, sir? So I, I, you were mentioning purple air and some of the other low cost sensors. Have you uh, had any opportunity to to compare kind of? maybe an aggregate reading of those sensors with something more uh, you know, uh, reference method like to see if, I mean, is it turning out that these low cost sensors are actually useful or is it all just junk? Not, not so to the answer to your first question and like bear in mind, I'm giving this uh, presentation on behalf of our subject matter expert who couldn't be here today. So if it, if it, some of it was vague, it was, Please accept my apologies. But to the best of my knowledge, I don't think that we have done uh, validation. We've seen the white papers saying this, that, or the other. But you know, after you know, you, you get a you get these things out in the field, and the white paper is about as good as right. what it's printed on. So uh, yeah, you're you're pretty much. I would like that's that's part of the future trends is that we're going to probably try to get a few of these ourselves and make sure that a, a meter properly engineered that has a performance guarantee associated with it is going to you know verify at least I mean even if that even if those those monitors are like 20% accurate like that would be good for the for the um, use that we would probably have for them as one community outreach to know what the what the part the particulate levels are sort of, and also, hey, maybe I got to send an inspector out there, which is personally what what I would use it for. Is like trend detection more than actual quantification. Yeah, like why you know why is it normally at ten or fifteen and now it's at. 65 70 what's going on and then yeah you find out that they're dragging a bunch of um, intermodal containers around there so yeah. thank you any any other questions sir uh, so the regulation 2019 um, requires the use of fem equipment only while all the subsequent regulations um, give the option for either reference method equipment you're talking about this one right yeah yes yeah. sir so I'm, I'm wondering was that decision to FEM meter reference uh, based on just progression of technology you felt that uh, meter reference has gotten to a point where it was used for some of these ordinances or was there a different project objective in the 
stop circuit regulations? That's a that's a that's an excellent question, and I happen to have been briefed on the answer. Um, the <coughs> this was sort of our first go at it, um, so accuracy and everything was very important. What we're learning as time goes on is the accuracy is important, but since we're not regulating directly on a lot of the, since we're not regulating directly, like as though it were NACs, right? Like since we're not regulating directly on like, uh, or not tending to regulate, I'm gonna say that, I'm gonna say it that way. Since we're not tending to regulate directly on the reading being, you know, well, you've exceeded background air quality standards. Um, what we're more concerned with, we're allowed, we're, we're gonna say we're more concerned with response time um, and, you know, viability economically too. We're gonna, we're, we're, we are concerned with that. We don't, we don't necessarily wanna just run these guys out of business. Like we wanna make sure that, we wanna make sure that they can, one, that the community is protected and two, that they can defend themselves, but three, also, if they're operating conscientiously, the, the, the operators, we want to make sure that they have data that they can respond to soon rather than wait for it to drift upward and then there's a, a lag on when the, when the particulate matter finally gets back under control. So I think those were the motivating factors in moving from the FEMs are specified to you just need something that gives you an accurate reading that you can respond to quickly. Um, and eventually, I, I forgot to mention this in the future trends, but we might, we, we're looking at taking, this is in preliminary discussions, but we're looking at taking the monitoring requirements out of the rules specifically and making a uniform standard for monitoring requirements. So it wouldn't just be, this is the rule for recycling facilities. This is the rules for asphalt plants. This is the rule for manganese. It's just going to be, if you have to do air monitoring, here are the specifications for what you have to do. I hope that answers your question. And I also hope it was accurate. Uh, any other questions? Don't be shy. Um, for this particular rule, the reporting is REL can be defined by the operators. Yeah, the I, subsequent rules that's, that's set to be based on some comparison with the NACs. You got it. Yep. Yeah. Or or with a lot of times it'd be NACs or it'd be ATSDRs. Uh, for example, in this case, um, 150 micrograms per cubic meter is your uh, you know inert particulate standard yeah. for you know hazard L, right? And I don't, I, I don't know if that's an eight hour, 24 a year, but, or a cube. Um, I don't, I know it's not a cube, but take uh, manganese is going to be 300 nanograms. So that's 0.3 micrograms, 0.3 micrograms, 0 0.3 micrograms, right? So that is a much lower, if you're breathing in this ferromanganese or, uh, or manganese or dust, much lower number so if some, somebody's driving over it it really depends on what it is you're breathing likewise i think um fugitive crystal and silica is uh, a little bit more dangerous than inert particulate uh at the um so even fugitive crystal and silica at 150 micrograms per cubic meter it's probably worse for you than just standard pm10 i mean average times on board for manganese i believe is quite a lot Right, that's for, that's for, yeah, that's for a year. A year, yeah. But I, I guess my question was, um, I have looked at these monitoring plans of what do operators use as an REL for this particular? I think, okay, I think we have, usually, usually it ends up being, it's never over 150, right? Put it that way. I think, I think they I think it's usually 150, right? Like, I think they, they just volunteer 150. I wasn't necessarily, yeah, I would have, it, when we were writing it, we would have probably said, we probably would have said, your RAL is 150. Um, we have some that are more stringent. Um, I think one of the facilities is doing it at 100, and they're taking action at 90, so. 
Or on a 15 minute average or? Uh, in this case, I think it's a 24 hour average. Okay. Right, so if they get, if, if, their aver if their rolling average over the last 24 hours is greater than the RAL they've specified, which let's just say for the purposes of uh, discussion is, is uh, 24 hours, then they're required to notify the city of, um, their, of their exceedance and their corrective action, right? It's not, it's not super punitive, right? It's just, hey man, let us know what's going on. And then we send an inspector down there and just making sure everything is, everything is fine between you know, the actions they're taking in the, the community. Because what we're what we're looking to avoid is a repeat of uh, that. This is what we don't want, right? So this is quite a bit higher than 150 micrograms per cubic meter. So, uh, but they don't have monitors at this point. So, but now if they have monitors, it's just like yeah, my monitor keeled over and died because of this. So, um, way before we get to that point. Having the monitors helps. Sir. So uh, the, the rules that you have here, are there equivalent or state rules? Or are these, is this like a whole plugging situation where the state rules, you really don't have them in place? So you're. Yeah. So in a lot of cases, right, um, it's interesting. Like the, in a lot of cases, this, a lot of the emissions from these places, um, say particularly I'm not gonna get into who but like a lot of the emissions like don't wouldn't require anything more than a Ross uh, right you know, yeah okay IEPA registration of smaller sources um, because of our density we're having to do the, you know where uh, where an air mod model might not necessarily show you the actual impact to immediate residents, like it would almost require a CFD model to, to show you like this is really what this facility is gonna, how it's gonna affect its, its uh, the local constituency. So yes, we are, we are putting in rules far in excess of what the state would require because of, just because of the density issues that we have. So I hope that you understand what I mean between yeah. CFD and an air dispersion model? Yeah, like it makes a, it makes a big difference. Okay, I am done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate that. Especially appreciate you filling in on such short notice. Now we'd like to welcome up Claire Amin and Brian Nugent, uh, account managers for Aeroqual. Brian is out of Wilmington, North Carolina, and Claire is from Detroit. So with that welcome, they're going to speak on regional and national regulatory issues. All right. Thank you, John. So Claire Amin is in, in the back there. Uh, due to limited space behind the podium, we decided to run solo on this one today. but. Uh, uh, Chicago, welcome. Um, really happy to be here. Uh, really grateful and happy to have Clean Air put this on. Um, Clean Air is our premier channel partner that really helps support and uh, sells and rents our equipment. And uh, without them, uh, we wouldn't be able to put our product out into the market. Um, so, um, how many folks here have heard of Aeroqual um, in, the, in the field? Okay, so we've got a good slew of So uh, today what I want to do is I want to present regional regulatory overview at a pretty high level. Um, Michael, great presentation on the Chicago regs. Um, you really opened the door for me to expand on quite a few of that with uh, some of the solutions that we offer. Um, there you go. 
So air quality, we've been protecting human health uh, from people breathing the air since 2001. Um, we are founded in New Zealand. I am this team that we have here, myself, Connor and Claire, we're here in the uh, States, here in North America. Um, and uh, we've been doing that by developing sensor technology that um, we've worked uh, pretty closely with EPA and designing this technology to supplement those areas where we just can't get equivalent reference methods out there, whether it be for power requirements or, or, or sometimes just cost, right? Uh, there's not enough money to put some of these stations out there in locations where they can't um, get vehicles back to, to build these areas. So we have uh, just renewed our five-year agreement, uh, renewed a five-year agreement with the Cooperative Research and um, Development uh, with the sensor technology. Uh, Jeff Henshaw, our CTO, um, is constantly coming here to uh, the U.S., meeting with folks at the EPA and, and different regions, uh, regulatory agencies. In fact, we just did a workshop, uh, I think, two weeks ago uh, for the EPA in North Carolina and in, in Raleigh. Um, we've got, I keep hitting the wrong button, we've got uh, several credentials that uh, we uh, align with, with EPA, uh, ASTM International. Uh, we work closely with MET1, MSERGE. Uh, we mentioned South Coast Air Quality Management District, um, and then, of course, we're ISO 9000. We have uh, monitors deployed around the world. Uh, I think that's important in understanding um, ambient air and, and the sensor technology because air is not the same everywhere you go as far as contaminants and pollutants that they're experiencing. Um, but we get a lot in North America, we get a lot of inquiries come to us um, and asking us about what solution they should use, uh, what are they required to use, and a lot of folks who are doing some of this work are not necessarily air monitoring experts. Um, you know, there's a different realm whether you're in a remediation site, doing reprocessable uh, sites, or you're trying to put an air monitoring system out there and they may not know. So I always like to start my, my presentation off with just a couple uh, questions. Uh, so not everybody answer it once, but who can tell me what the basic composition of air is? Uh, <laughs> who said that? Oh, very good, very good. You win the prize, it's back on the table back there. Um, I'll deliver it to you later. So we've got 78% nitrogen, right? 21% oxygen and the rest trace gases. Um, I know this is elementary and I know most of you do know those answers and it just wasn't an overwhelming response from everyone. Um, I get that in most of my presentations. Uh, but it is important to just kind of start with the basics and, and build up from there. So, in 1963, um, they enacted the Clean Air Act, right, and identified hazardous air pollutants. I just did a presentation where the, an EPA official corrected me and made me change it to about 187 air pollutants because it's constantly changing. Um, you see the picture there. I recently uh, was I did a trip in Pittsburgh and uh, did one of the duck tours out there. Volker, you may know that you're from the Pittsburgh area, but um, and they were explaining how the buildings were all stained black back in the day when heavy in industry was there, and they showed some of the granite that was still black that they couldn't get cleaned off um, and just we've come such a long way and cleaning the air and you know making it habitable for people to live right so we've done a good job with that I'm not going to ask you to name all 187 hazardous air pollutants um, but I will uh, ask you about the criteria pollutants because in 1970 they established criteria pollutants the um, um, National Ambient uh, Air Quality Standards can anybody list or name for me the six criteria pollutants that the EPA is looking at? One, two, three, maybe? Lead. Lead, we've got one, very good. I, I can't hear if anybody else is calling anything out. Water vapor. <laughs> no? SO2. No. <laughs> SO2. Knox. Knox. 
PM10, oh, PM, yeah, we'll say PM. Yeah. Ozone. Ozone, and there's one more. VOC. No? Uh, yeah. It starts with a C. Oh, CO. CO, very good, very good. Okay, so you guys have done pretty well today so far, all right? All right, so we've got our EPA uh, six criteria pollutants, and then um, the national uh, air, ambient air quality standards uh, developed. I can't read this thing that's here, and I'm used to looking at this. So uh, we've got uh, the uh, primary and secondary standards, right? So primary is for the health protection of the community, and then secondary is the uh, public um, uh, welfare protection. Uh, and we've got, for each of the criteria pollutants, you have, well, carbon dioxide has a primary, but you have, those are all your levels that you have to abide by. The EPA uh, mandates that you uh, will, will uh, designate areas of attainment uh, for where you need to be. And then it's up to the states to have their, um, it's called a uh, implementation plan, the state imp implementation plan. And then they monitor uh, for that, right? And then you obviously have to be in attainment. That's the goal uh, for those six criteria pollutants. So recently, um, EPA has come out with some changes. Uh, they've announced some proposals. Uh, we've got uh, changes related to community air monitoring, methane emissions, PM 2.5 standard, ethylene oxide, and ozone. Those are just some of the main ones that they have, have looked at recently. Um, the ARP for Community Air Monitoring American Rescue Plan um, in June of 2021, um, they are looking, and they've actually already uh, put this out, people uh, submitted grant uh, proposals or grant applications to uh, win this money, um, and most of it has been awarded. Um, whether it's been distributed or not, that may be another while before they get the money. Um, I can give a little overview on that. They're still struggling with uh, the communities being able to prepare a proper QUAP, uh, quality assurance uh, plan on what they're doing. And we've actually found that a lot of these communities that are reaching out and, and have been awarded this money uh, really don't understand you know, what they're doing with the equipment. And we look at a lot of these low cost sensors that they're trying to purchase and they don't have a plan for how they're gonna maintain them, calibrate them, and, and keep them running. So uh, the EPA official I was talking to out of Region 4 was saying that they feel like they've made a mistake before they put that out there because uh, they're so overwhelmed with people questioning how to implement this. So they've got the money, they're waiting to distribute that. But they're looking at replacing existing filter base uh, PM 2.5 monitors um, and that would provide 24-7 uh, real-time um, reporting the automation of PM 2.5, the enhancement of PM 2.5, and um, uh, five other air pollutants related um, to the uh, air ambient uh, quality standards. Um, conduct monitoring of pollutants of greatest concern in certain areas, and then looking at mobile monitoring labs or sensor loaner programs. Uh, so that was uh, for the ARP. Uh, the EPA proposal to reduce methane, and we're going to cover off this in a little bit more detail later on, um, and, and what we have done. Um, but in November of 2022, uh, the agency is uh, uh, proposed a standard to cut methane and looking to cut it by about 87%. Um, and they feel that that would be the equivalent of 810 metric tons of carbon dioxide uh, reduction. Um, we move over to the PM 2.5 standard and going back to the primary um, standard for this, they are looking to um, uh, reduce this uh, level, uh, uh, current level of 12 down to, uh, uh, down to between 9 and 10 uh, micrograms per meter cube. So PM and then um, ethylene oxide, ethylene oxide, oxide is used in sterilization. Um, facilities and they're looking to reduce that. We don't dabble in ethylene oxide, so I don't have a ton of information to, <laughs> to help you with that one, but um, they are looking to reduce that by about 80%. And then um, lastly, uh, and most recently in August of 20, um, 
2023, um, they are proposed to take a uh, review the current standards for ozone. Uh, so changes may be coming with that, but that's just under review at this point. And then looking at regional uh, regulations, um, and Michael covered most all of this for the Chicago area, and I'm at a pretty high level on this. Um, and New York back in 2010 established DER 10, uh, which is looking at PM 10 and VOCs on uh, remediation sites. Uh, you guys, if you're not from that region and not working in that region, it's probably not going to mean too much. Um, but they are in the process of rewriting some of those rules and changing them. Um, a lot of these rules uh, that were written back then, um, some of the things are changing is that technology has changed so much that you're changing some of the requirements, uh, equipment requirements that you can and can't deploy on sites at this point. And then in 2021, Chicago Department of Public Health, demolition by implosion. Uh, it's funny you had that picture up there because I actually have a, a video I show in other presentations and I have that toppling over and uh, it's uh, I always get everybody like wow yeah, it's an impressive implosion but they didn't do a great job with the dust right so um, but uh, looking at that um, they are looking and allowing near reference PM 10 monitors uh, for this and um, we again get a ton of inquiries to come in and say hey uh, there's this new rule in Chicago for demolition and I was like it's not new it's just really being more enforced at this point, um, right? There was so much attention brought to that um, with that Crawford Power Plant. Um, and then we mentioned South Coast AQMD, Rule 1466 was amended in 2023. Um, and uh, that is a, um, uh, we're starting to see a lot of their regulations, a lot of their rules starting to make its way across the U.S. Um, and a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, agency are starting to look at what they're doing and adopt some of their rules and regulations. And if the equipment is good enough for them, it's gonna be good enough for use in their, their regulations. And then um, uh, in March, 2023, uh, the, the uh, revised rules for reprocessable, reprocessable construction demolition materials uh, facilities, um, allowing near reference uh, equipment uh, to be used um, on those sites. So I'm not gonna cover this too much in detail, uh, but we talked about criteria pollutants and then we talked about the other uh, pollutants of concern. Um, I've tried to build this chart out. Um, I am not the expert in reference or equivalent methods. Um, I will state that, uh, but I have consulted with many folks and uh, just tried to fill in uh, as much as I could on this chart um, to look at what your options are. And then um, of course the near reference is listing our equipment, um, our modules that we have available. Um, a lot of uh, feedback that I've gotten from folks working in the regulatory um, or in the reference uh, field, uh, they mentioned how similar our equipment was built and designed to kind of mirror that. So we can utilize the same type of calibration equipment, same calibration processes, and it's, it's just very similar. So we've tried our best to make it not only near reference data, but as near similarity and um, use and calibration as possible as well. So with all that, uh, I just want to introduce our products. We touched on this. Um, I'm not going to go too in detail. We've got some, some workshops that we can work on that go deeper in this. But our product is a fully integrated solution of hardware and software that is going to help you uh, stay in compliance by having good quality uh, equipment to produce good results, but also um, software that's going to provide data visualization, uh, give you defensible, real-time, uh, actionable data, right? So you can make decisions quickly. And I think that's what you were commenting on, Michael, on, on some of these sites is, you know, how fast can you respond to this? It's, you know, it's great that you have this data, but if you didn't take action when you needed to, then it's really all for nothing. It's, it's already moved, moved on. So uh, what I've done is on all of these slides, you'll see, uh, oh yeah, I'm supposed to use the laser. You'll see the um, EPA symbol down there. And I've just tried to tag that on anything that we had as a solution that supports um, some of the new, new rules and changes that have come along. So the dust entry with a nephilometer installed, um, 
using that to replace existing filter-based PM10 2.5 monitors, right? And we're, we're talking about the high volume samplers that are, you know, pulling in, you know, thousand liters a minute. You've got to take the filter, send it to the lab and get it analyzed. It's super accurate, um, right? I mean, it's, a, it's an analytic, analytic that you're, you're getting from that. It's not real time. It is expensive. Um, it requires, you know, at least 110 volt power to run that where we can run these units on um, 12 volt battery and for long term add a solar panel to keep it running. Um, and it's gonna provide you real time data. Um, along with that, um, so, so the nephilometer is gonna allow you to speciate your PM. So it's gonna be one size fraction, uh, TSP, PM10, 2.5 or PM1. And the Dust Sentry Pro, um, is a particle counter, and that's gonna allow you to simultaneously uh, read PM1, 2.5, 10, and TSP. Um, and it as well would replace that PM10, 2.5 monitor um, and give you 24 seven. Now it's not as accurate as a nephilometer, just by nature on how it works. Um, and it will, we don't go into detail right there on that, but um, it is accurate enough for, for some sites uh, in lieu of the nephilometer. So on the side with gases, um, we have, Airqual has um, manufactured um, quite a few uh, gases, gas modules. Um, in these modules, we incorporate in that automatic baseline correction, uh, which uh, if you're familiar with sensor technology, sensors do drift over time. So with that technology, we're scrubbing that sample back to um, a zero, eliminating that drift and allow uh, you to run these units for quite a long time um, uh, and stay accurate uh, between calibrations. So with this, um, with all these modules available, we're looking at the ability to conduct monitoring of pollutants of greatest concern. Um, uh, we're probably one of the only manufacturers out there that can do as many gases um, in one unit, one box, uh, as, you know, with accuracy. The unit showed here is an AQM65, which uh, includes, uh, on this picture it's showing, oh, it actually has an auto calibrator in it. So allowing you to set up remote or automatic calibration, scheduled calibrations. Um, so with this, um, I don't think it's shown here, but uh, we've just added a methane module um, and that is available now to the market and conducting, conducting monitoring, conduct monitoring of pollutants of greatest concern with what we have here, and then strengthening standards for methane. Uh, we'll add that to our uh, collection and allow you to uh, use this as a solution for that. So we also have a portable handheld cloud connected um, Ranger is, is what we have. I think we have one in the back there. Now this, um, we talk about agencies for mobile monitoring labs. Now we have had folks um, build equipment inside of vehicles and they'll drive them around and, and sample from them, do air monitoring from that, but also short-term loaner programs. And we're starting to see this become very popular in universities um, and even some local agencies. Uh, these units uh, can be deployed, um, they're cloud connected, so you can leave them behind and do remote monitoring. It's indoor, I mean, you're not gonna be able to leave these outside uh, for that purpose, but indoor air quality, um, uh, purposes and spot checking outside as well, but um, not in the weather. But this allows you to switch the heads and we can monitor up to 14 different gases uh, plus PM uh, with these units. Um, and uh, Michael touched on this earlier uh, when you're talking about community monitoring and all of the low cost sensors that are out there and are they providing meaningful, meaningful data or not? Um, so we have just patented, um, and we do have a white paper that is worth the paper it's written on, um, uh, for MoMA. And what MoMA is, is moment matching. And what we're able to do is uh, support these communities uh, where they have uh, large networks, um, smaller networks as well, um, where we can actually uh, virtually calibrate their sensors, um, whether they're um, uh, purple air, or not, um, we have to have anchor stations in place. There has to, there's criteria to meet uh, to be able to do this. Um, but we are able to help these communities make sure that the data is meaningful by deploying this software and working with them uh, to make sure that the, 
data that they're getting is representative of what at least the nearby reference station is, is telling them. And uh, we're able to do that, uh, provide that data, and um, uh, it's been, been very popular. It's been picking up um, around, the, around the nation at this point. So if you're interested in that, we'd have to have a consultation with you to see if it would work for your site or not. But um, uh, yeah, that we're very excited about that. And of course, with this um, enhanced um, uh, quality monitoring for the communities, um, you know, again, looking at all these different uh, standards uh, for PM 2.5, automation of the PM 2.5, and replacing of, of these monitors. So, with all that hardware, um, giving you, providing good data, you do need a way to visualize that data and look at that data. And without having the, the proper tool or software to do that, then uh, it requires you going to the field, downloading, and, and bringing all that back. Um, so uh, automation of PM 2.5 monitors is, is uh, available through our, our cloud, and we have multiple platforms for you to, to be able to access that. So data visualization. Um, one of the key points that I like to bring up, I'm, I'm not gonna go through all how to export and show you all of that stuff. That's pretty much expected when you're working with a remote cloud or telemetry. Um, I go back to all the inquiries that I get and when uh, folks are asking me, what do I need? How do I do this? And I always mention, well, at least wind speed, wind direction, one on a site. And it's like, well, we've got a local station. We can look at that and we can do all that. Well, that's great, but that's not your site, right? Wind changes, whipping through buildings or whatever may happen. So you do need and should put a wind speed, wind direction uh, monitor on one of your units. And with that, our airfall uh, cloud will actually produce uh, wind pollution rose charts for you. Uh, so some folks are familiar with these and some folks are not. So I broke it down into this little example here. So the way that this is representing is this, these rings are giving me percentage of time. So in this unit here, this is showing me that the wind is almost 25% of the time blowing from the northeast to the southwest. Uh, but the green, le green color indicates pretty low PM levels, right? If I look over here, about, what's that, 14% of the time or so, the wind is blowing from the southwest to the northeast, and you can see that the PM levels have increased, right? Pretty quick, easy visualization for what we're doing. So for somebody over here looking at this, and they're able to see this data, they're saying, hey, well, look at this. This coal fire power plant is polluting my air and they're all up in arms and they're all mad at the coal fire plant right well my question would be well what if there's another facility back here creating pollution right these guys are doing everything they can to keep theirs in compliance the community doesn't know that they're blaming these guys because they're the big pockets or whatever and you got somebody else back here. So we've created what we call site contribution, um, site contribution tool, which is going to actually take that upwind and downwind and look at the absolute um, pollution on your site, what's coming onto your site and what's leaving your site. Um, and that is a, uh, we've really just rolled that out within the last year or so. Um, we've had a couple really good case studies that we're going to cover off here a little bit later in another presentation and show you how that worked and, and what they did with that. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really about your data outcome, right? Uh, did you get the answers you want? Um, are you using the right solution, right? You've got to pick and choose uh, based on the regulations that are in place, um, the common sense of sensitive receptors that might be right next door to you, right? Um, making sure that you're protecting the community and, and protecting yourselves and your client as, as consultants. So that's the end of my presentation on this part. I'll be back up in a little on a presentation later, but uh, any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, about the Roma. Could you, could you speak up because we have the people yes. on. So about the MoMA approach, 
Uh, are you, you, you said you were using anchor stations um, as a point of reference. Uh, are these anchor stations reference methods or are they near reference? Or well, both? Yeah, great question. So um, every site is, is unique, of course. Uh, we do want to have at least one reference station in, in a nearby proximity. Um, and then we can supplement some near reference um, as anchor points as well. Have you seen any difference in outcome when you use near reference versus, versus reference? Or have you had well, I mean, we have quite a few. Yeah, we have quite a few co-location studies where we can put our near reference, I mean, that's how we've coined that term, near reference, where we can get very good, um, you know, our square value uh, response on that. So uh, we're, we're confident in our near reference uh, to the reference. Uh, it's, it's the surrounding uh, equipment, whether it's the low cost sensors that we really have to look at and, and, and question what's happening. Not only are we able to, um, virtually calibrate, but we can also look at the equipment and, and provide heads up notice that sensors are starting to fail um, and they're not performing well. So, can, yes. can you explain the virtual calibration? I'm not sure I understand what you, or maybe this isn't the right presentation Scott, to do that. Scott, can you walk up and use the microphone? Can you hear you? What microphone? So he asked, um, he asked, can I explain virtual calibration? Okay, so virtual calibration means that we're not going into the instrument and changing any um, any values on that instrument. That instrument's gonna continue to run. What we're doing is taking that data that that instrument is providing, and we are virtually calibrating the data on paper and providing that back to you to say this is- So you're pulling in the data from these, these low cost sensors. Correct. And then applying a calibration correction to it based on your reference. Correct, correct. There's a lot of science behind that that I couldn't even begin to, to tell you. Um, but that's essentially how that's going. So I have a question for you guys. What's the basic composition of air? You said it, right? Nitrogen and oxygen, right? 78%. Well, I thank you guys for allowing me to present to you today. Um, and uh, I'll be back up for a presentation a little later. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, next up, we have Volker Schmidt of Clean Air Engineering. He's out of our Pittsburgh office and runs our advanced monitoring division. He's been with us roughly 20 years. And he's my friend. I appreciate that. Um, all right, so I'm Volker Schmidt. I'm um, the program manager for Clean Air's Fugitive Emissions and Ambient Air Monitoring Program. Uh, and I am from Pittsburgh, and uh, you've seen these pictures. Uh, the story that came to mind is the house I live in um, is uh, made of limestone, and some of the, the stones are checkered because they're sued on the limestone. At some point in time, a contractor came up to me and said, Hey, I can't wash this off for you. I said, Why would you want to do this? It's, history. Uh, I certainly do take pride coming from the Steel City and uh, yes, uh, we have come a long way since those days. So, um, so I'm here today to talk a little bit about monitoring program design and data analysis considerations. This is by no means going to be very exhaustive. I have 15 to 20 minutes, but I figured I'd put a few points together just to spark some discussions, points for discussion later perhaps, and maybe some thoughts on your end. Um, typically, when you look at design of a program, um, you know, certain questions that arise. Well, what am I going to use? How am I going to operate this? How am I going to sign all of these systems? And so on. And so let's just go down that list, and I hope that's not too disjointed that came together late yesterday. So when you look at, looks like I'm a little bit behind here, when you look at you know, equipment selection, as previous presenters already mentioned, it all depends on project, your project monitoring objectives, your data quality objectives. And when I talk about this a little bit and how different technologies suit uh, or are better, uh, better fit for certain applications, I like to bring out this, this graph here. This is kind of the first time the EPA 
uh, published uh, their approach or their consideration of, of non-reference method equipment to be used for certain applications, right? Um, this came out in 2016, I believe, so it's not too long ago. It was really driven by the rapid development in monitoring technologies, low-cost sensing technologies, uh, technology, and so on. And uh, so the authors put this into this table, kind of trying to visualize uh, data quality, um, fitting applications to data quality, relative cost, and then the coverage that, that you can achieve with those technologies, right? And so the first one on the left upper side, certainly ambient air monitoring network and source compliance, that is really, when it boils, boils down to its application to take reference method or federal equivalent method equipment, put it out there, well characterized equipment uh, that is operated consistently across the board according to strict reference, uh, to strict monitoring guidelines in order to generate data that's then being used to assess your compliance or compliance with the national ambient air quality standards, with the health-based uh, standard. Um, for criteria pollutants, I'm not going to ask the question, we already covered this, what are criteria pollutants? This typically is, is a straightforward answer, what, uh, what you have to use, right? And so those are federal reference and equivalent method uh, technologies for PM10, Federal reference method typically boils down to the use of gravimetric, so gravimetric analysis, so uh, high or low volume filter, uh, low volume samplers, um, depositing mass on a filter. This is a filter-based method. Um, however, there's also FEM methods. We talked about those already. Um, I just grabbed three of those. Again, if you would like to have the whole list, you can go to the list of designated reference and equivalent methods. It's, it's published on the EPA website, updated twice a year. Um, for equivalent method, these three are by no means endorsed by us. It just happens that we have used them uh, recently, those three technologies, and we are clean air, we rent systems, and so certainly those can be rented as others as well from us. And so, um, different technologies with different basic principles, um, but the commonality is they're well characterized, have gone through a lot of testing by the EPA, and can be used consistently to show your attainment or uh, with, with the National Ambient Air Quality Standard for PM10. All right, let's go down the list here. Um, a step below assessment of, of NACS compliance is supplemental air monitoring network, uh, supplement air monitoring network application. So if you do not, if it's okay for your program, for your monitoring objective to, to use, take a step down in the data quality, uh, in the data quality trajectory there, um, you can use something like the dust sentry, for instance, we talked about this. It's a near, it's considered near reference method, certainly more cost effective to operate and to install in turn allowing to perhaps use more of them at the site, right? So the dust sentry is near reference and I just want to point a few things out which in my mind make it quite applicable and certainly near reference is that if you look at how the sample is treated, uh, you have there the VSCC, what that stands for is a, um, it's a cyclone, a very sharp cut cyclone takes all the coarse particles out of the air and only PM10 passes through. Then there's an inlet heater, so you take out all the humidity to remove any interferences from humidity, and then it goes into the scattering engine that Brian talked about. And the scattering engine also actually has a zero purge and the drift correction, which automatically puts in zero air to perform some drift correction. So it's certainly a step below the equivalent method, but it's a step per, perhaps above the next tier, and that would be in your, your community-based monitoring, near source screening, or, edu or uh, use of equipment for personal monitoring or quant qualitative educational and qualitative purposes. And so um, now what I have to say here is that over the past six years, this is six years old, I think the, the 
lower two tiers here, they, they already kind of merge together because uh, either one of those, if you're talking about you know, the purple air monitor, this is something that you see at schools, even in the communities, all the way up to what Aeropol offers here is an AQYR. There is a difference, um, but they all can be used for the same purpose. Uh, now, when it comes to the city of Chicago, essentially the regulation take that guesswork out of it uh, in assigning methods or sorry not assigning methods but assigning what instrumentation you can use so not to belabor this too long those are the four rules we have talked about earlier uh, the first one can use FEM this is the oldest rule from 2019 uh, and you can also use FEM equipment certainly for the other three rules but as, as Mike pointed out near reference method equipment can be used for those to comply with those rules all right, um, that kind of covers the technology side of things, but you can have the best analyzer in the world uh, if you do not provide a representative sample to the analyzer or cite it properly so it gets a representative sample, it doesn't mean anything. So in some people's mind, and certainly for us, um, coming from a stack testing background, representative sample, getting a representative sample from point A to point B is, is uh, more important at times too. And, uh, the technology that you use. So let's talk a little bit about representativeness. All right, so in the ambient air world, what that means is you gotta make sure that the space, spatial scale of the air parcel that is measured by the equipment measures your monitoring objective, rolls off the tongue. And all that means is if you wanna measure background air, you don't take your monitors or concentration maybe in, in background air or uh, in regional air masses that moving in. Uh, you don't take your monitors and put you right next to the highway because all you're gonna measure is dust being kicked up by the highway or perhaps uh, combustion products, right? That's all that means. And uh, at that point, that is acceptable if you wanna measure impact of highway traffic on maybe the pedestrians around there. Uh, but then the concentration that you pick up are representative of the scale, the micro scale, which is close vicinity of, um, of that cross section. So uh, I didn't come up with this, uh, this graphic that's uh, in the enhanced air sensor guidebook. Um, I highly recommend reading through this. A lot of interesting nuggets in there. I did modify it. Um, Transparent. Now, what does it mean for some of the regulations uh, in the city of Chicago? Well, the measurement scales of greatest interest if you if you were to do or if you are if you have to do a source impact assessment and contribution analysis, what we have been talking about, can be all three of these scales: micro scale less than 100 meter, middle scale 100 to 500 meter, or neighborhood scale five to about 4,000 meters. So. Um, if you like to monitor the impact of a facility in a residential neighborhood, you're probably better off going right to the receptor site in that neighborhood. You've got to make sure that uh, the air that you do measure is representative of the air coming from a facility. Uh, if you like to know what's moving into the facility, moving out of the facility, you come a little bit closer, you try to stay away from, from traveled roads and so on just to make sure that really you measure your your air parcel and concentration that you measure is representative of what you actually want to measure right so what does it come down to um, simply follow the EPA and I shouldn't say simply and you will understand in a second uh, follow the EPA side and guidances as much as you can so these guidances and again I point out the enhanced air sensor guidebook is a good resource Another great resource is the Quality Assurance Handbook for air pollution measurement systems. So uh, if you'd like to uh, um, meet me later, I'll give you a link or just Google this, it's fine too. Um, so try to follow those guidances and that includes distance from obstructions, roadways, probe inlet heights, where that has to be for your purpose and so on. However, 
no side is ideal. I mean, I rarely go on a side where everything fits great. So the final side is typically, is almost always a compromise. You have to make compromises and, and you just have to decide what compromises you're willing to take and what impact that has on your data quality and meeting your quality objective. And so uh, you need to evaluate this and make sure that it's, you still get the data that you need, right? And most importantly, and we talk about this a little bit later, document your final locations and the deviation of the guidelines. So when you look at the data later on, you understand why certain things look that way they, they are. All right, now one thing I haven't talked about, and Brian touched on this a little bit earlier, is do not forget your meteorological station. They, they are important because, especially when you do this uh, source contribution analysis, you cannot underestimate uh, the importance of the data that comes from the, met, from the MET station. And there are siting guidelines as well, and you need to be mindful of how representative is your MET data. Uh, for instance, if you want to know that there's a power plant over there and you want to know what the regional air movement is uh, coming across the entire area, you cannot put the MET station close to a building or so on. It's going to get you meteorological conditions within maybe certain hundred feet and so on. Certainly it's not going to tell you the story how the air moves in and out of the, out of the region. So uh, be mindful of that. Um, it all comes down to tower height requirements, typically 10 meters, what EPA says, so you're kind of away from the, um, from the boundary layer, minimize boundary layer, layer effects, surface is important, Dis distance from obstruction certainly, again, surface properties, slopes, and, and so on. Now all of this is covered in this handbook here. Uh, again, look this handbook up, it's a very interesting, interesting read. Uh, follow siting guidelines as much as you can and similar to the other considerations, the, the PM10 monitors, document any deviations and what impact you think it will have on your measurement. All right, uh, one thing that comes up more often than not, and I'll just throw this out there uh, because it's not really covered in the, in the handbook, is uh, can I put a MET station on top of a building? It's highly discouraged because of your wake effects and so on. Um, that's covered in a, in a, in a different, uh, different, different literature. So we typically, unless you really have to, and that's the only place you can put this, you, you try to get away from putting these things on buildings. So. All right, documentation, very brief. Um, technology is one aspect, representative siding another one. At the end of the day, you have to operate your systems, your networks, and so on, and uh, you, so you need to plan. Typically want high quality data, you've got to do quality assurance. Um, the best would be to have a quality assurance monitoring plan that specifies how you operate your equipment, how you operate your network, uh, including standard operating procedures, designated forms, and so on, so the operation is consistent across the board. Now, for reference method stations run as a state and local m air monitoring station, there is a set of guidelines you have to follow. For near reference method station networks, it's really up to you. If you would like to generate defensible data, it really behooves you to put a monitoring plan into place, have standard operating procedures and so on. Um, again, document everything. Have a site acceptance test, document siting, all cardinal directions of your probe placements, med station placement, and, and, and. Uh, we even go to the extent of having a corrective action process. If there is something that looks odd, we initiate corrective action, document all of this. Because if you don't document it, it never happened, right? Uh, quality assurance, one slide, and I was debating to put this in, but I figure I'll, I'll do this um, to kind of get you a sense of what the performance requirements are. And there are performance requirements set by the EPA for regulatory monitoring and your know, accuracy, precision. There are certain ways to, to get those for gases you run, your span gases and zero for particulate monitoring. At some point you have to do, run a side by side. Even if you have an equivalent method, you run a reference method monitor once in a while. So um, those are federally set 
precision and bias error, errors they have to meet. For criteria pollutants, PM10 and PM2.5 less than 10%. Data completeness, that's your uptime. For regulatory systems that are run as state, local ambient air monitoring station SLAMs, it's larger than 75%. Uh, that number there comes out of an analysis that uh, someone did, I've seen it in a technical resource document by the EPA, where it was evaluated how much data do I need to still make decisions with respect to the NAAQS attainment or compliance uh, with a given certainty. So that's where the 75% comes, comes from. Uh, all these, these other tiers, and they kind of tie back to the initial slides that I showed, uh, about the different tiers and project objectives. This is all empirical. Um, again, this is five to six years old, comes out of the original sensor guidebook, interesting read as well, um, looking at a lot of different studies that people did and what kind of data completeness targets they, they went with or went for, what kind of precision bias error they have seen and so on. So, Take this with a grain of salt. Certainly, technology has advanced, has a big part of this, um, and sometimes you don't need full data completeness for certain objectives. So, I don't think there's a data completeness requirement uh, for the rules of the city of Chicago. Is there? What do you mean by data? Uh, how data availability? Can the monitor be done 50% of the time, for instance? Uh, it, it's not. No, okay, so the rules that I'm most familiar with are the ones that require the FEMs. Yeah. You do have to notify us. Um, if it becomes a pattern, then we're going to go out there and see what the real issue is. Yeah. And if, if, if it, then it becomes a matter of enforcement of the rules saying you need the monitors and you're not making a reasonable effort to keep them up. Yeah. I mean, I've seen this in, in individual monitoring plans, and that's where we put this in at times. Yeah. Um, certain target, yeah. Uh, consent decrees sometimes have for PM10, 80%. Uh, rarely we see 90%. I mean, it's, it's difficult to, to maintain those systems all the way around. So last but not least, just a few nuggets on the data management analysis side. Uh, sounds like the city of Chicago is using quite an advanced uh, system and virus suite. And for folks who are not familiar with EnviroSuite, uh, EnviroSuite provides uh, data aggregation, takes all data in from low cost as well as reference method or equivalent method equipment, um, allows you to do on-demand dispersion modeling, back trajectory tracking. Uh, if there's a nuisance complaint, you can look at nuisance complaint clusters, and I'm not sure if you use it, but I know the city of Pittsburgh, which I don't think believe, believe uses uh, EnviroSuite, but they look at nuisance clusters to set an inspector out and provide a nose, a reference nose, so to speak, right? Um, so, um, in any case, so one thing that happens if you have these networks in place, they just generate massive amounts of data. We're talking millions of data points, right? Um, it's just massive, massive amounts of data, at which point your Excel spreadsheet is kind of, starts to become useless. It just cannot crunch all that data. So one, um, one package that I know the EPA is using quite a bit, we are using it quite a bit as well to crunch data is uh, a statistical package called ours, open source, um, especially the open air library is, is, is great. You guys use it all, the city? Yes, yes, yes. okay. So uh, there's a reference there. Um, crunches data, does uh, fantastic analysis or provides fantastic analysis um, uh, possibilities. One of them is um, the source direction indicator plot. I didn't coin this phrase. Um, that comes from, I think, Evatoma by the EPA. I've seen that the first. And what it really is, is a bivariate polar plot that takes your pollutant concentrations and puts it in relation with wind speed and wind direction. And if you have lots and lots and lots of data, at times you can see certain, uh, certain patterns forming and you can use those patterns to point one way or the other. Hey, it might be coming from there, it might be coming from there. So um, pollution measurement is as important as meteorological data at that moment, right? All right, uh, another little nugget here, and then we talked about this, that it's important to always have upwind and downwind data. 
and to compare data. It doesn't have to be the same source, can be on the same site, maybe different sites and so on, but uh, at times have a look at all the data that's available to you. So for this particular uh, here, what I try to show you here is that uh, this is from June 28th and 29th of this year. We talked about this a little bit, a lot of wildfire smoke coming in. So if, if, you, would, if you look at the city of Chicago, RALs, they're 150 micrograms, you would have blown right past this if you would have based your decision on just one monitor. Um, this one here, if you have up and down, it shows that regional air is moving in, uh, facility has no impact, and it will not hit the RAL, that matter. Now, external data source, you can go to fire.airnow.gov. This is from last night, so certainly not from this period, but it, tell, it shows you the plumes that are coming in and out of the region from wildfire, right? So um, look all the data that you can, that you can get your hand on. Uh, next one. Your question, Scott. So it, it, it also behooves you at times to look at, compare um, data that you generate with higher, maybe with equivalent method technology, near reference, and compare to whatever else is out there. Um, Purple Air, for instance, makes most of these local sensors put the data and then unscreen put it in the cloud. You can pull down raw data. Uh, you don't know how it's being accumulated, what you do, what the technology is. You don't know how it's being maintained, whether it's cited properly, but it's there. And at times can be very useful. You can pull this data down and compare it with what you have. This particular one here uh, is uh, our, our, our two data sources are um, a purple air monitor in the community and then a near reference monitor, I think it's a dust sentry around an industrial facility kind of downwind of the facility. And uh, I looked around, pulled some data off, and graphed them side by side now. Very noisy, sometimes you have to average a bit longer, and, but you, what you can see here, they, they can trend. Uh, quite reasonable here, given different technologies and siding and so on, and the limitations. So if you do this, at times you can judge whether facilities have an impact, besides how the technology performs. Here you would say, well, it seems a lot of regional air moving in and out with no impact of the facility, perhaps, if you want to really go that far out. Again, you have no idea how um, the some of these monitors are implemented and so on. But it's always good to pull data in from different sources, compare them, see what you can learn. And that is it. So. Any questions? All right, well, thank you for your attention. And I believe we are at a break. How about that? Yeah. So we'll take 15 minutes, help yourself to more coffee, water. Restrooms are upstairs if you need them. We'll be back in about 15.
Deflating, you're standing up here, and nobody's paying attention. started with the second half of our presentations. Welcome back. For our next presentation, we will have Eric Walls, Connor Porter, and Brian Nugent discussing site contribution analysis and Eric Walls site contribution tool. Please welcome Connor and Brian back to the stage. So I'm back again. You recognize me. This is not my bodyguard. This is actually Connor Porter, who is going to be uh, presenting here. So as mentioned earlier, I brought up site contribution and uh, you know what, how that tool would work for you. Um, we'll go back to this just if you can. Uh, remember what we had going on here, uh, where we had the community over here in a coal-fired power plant here, and based off of this windrows pollution, the community's thinking, well, hey, these guys have been polluting us, and uh, in reality, there's there's somebody back here that's uh, contributing to that pollution, and so how do how do they determine? How do you go about proving that you know you're in compliance and the guy behind you is not? So. couple slides only. Uh, so uh, site contribution is the tool that uh, we're going to represent here. This is just a quick screenshot of, of what it would look like um, where we're able to see our, our monitor, see our site, um, and then it'll track av your average contribution, wind speed, and uh, raw data. Uh, Connor will go through that. Um, but I want to present on this case study that we did. Um, this is out in California at the uh, U.S. Navy Alameda fleet, uh, their site. Um, I always bring up uh, Mythbusters, if anybody ever saw Mythbusters. Uh, they were always out on that runway testing and doing their, their thing, right? Good show. Uh, this is that site that, um, that they were working on. But um, this is uh, back in 2019, uh, Catellus and Vista Environmental Consultants. Um, we, uh, uh, we had not fully rolled out site contribution. In fact, we didn't even have that, that term or tool um, you know, posted at this point. Um, we were able to use that on this site, and then we have refined it and rolled it out recently, about a year ago, I guess, is, is the full deployment. So they're working this site, and uh, they had been working on uh, area number five here, and then most recently, moved over to number one. 
the site had a few challenges where the wind would blow right up this channel. I can't see that that well. Blow up this channel here. And number two was a marine terminal uh, where they maintained, painted, and cleaned yachts. And then up here, number three was an intermodal uh, rail yard. And number four was a metal uh, shredder, a recycler. So uh, the community was very concerned about the work that they had been doing on this site, uh, concerned about the pollution, their health and safety uh, from what they were doing. And um, Catellus had to come up with a solution and they ended up with their approach. Number one, address the community, explain to them what they were doing and what tools that they were putting in place to ensure that they were protecting their, their health and safety. Um, they ended up going with three air wall dust sentries with PM10 and a MET station. Um, they utilized our cloud, uh, which gave them uh, the ability to download all of their data and visually see certain things. Uh, but they added to it site contribution. And site contribution, again, is taking your upwind and downwind. Uh, and it could be dynamic, that could change. Uh, the software knows always what is upwind and what is downwind, so it accounts for that that change and it calculates the amount of PM dust or whatever pollution you had on site at the time to understand what was background, what came onto your site and what left your site. So it's going to give you the absolute value. Um, they were able uh, to deploy this and successfully um, were able to achieve their regulatory compliance uh, at 100%. Uh, they kept their nuisance dust down. Uh, they built their community trust and they were able to prove that the, uh, that the dust, in fact, was coming from the metal recycler upwind of them. Um, they were able to uh, eliminate the cost. They were charging them, the marina was charging them $60,000 to repaint some yachts. Um, and so having good data, having the right tools on site um, does mean a whole lot. I mean, it's protecting the community, but also if you're a consultant and you're representing your client, um, you're protecting your client best interest as well. So a valuable tool. Um, before I turn it over to Connor, who's just going to kind of go run through the mechanics of this. Uh, anybody have any questions on site contribution? So um, we talked about the regional regulations earlier. Um, so Rule 1466, South Coast AQMD, um, we actually worked directly with them in building this software to meet their standards. So we actually have a rule now that it, um, it's been rolled out. You can go on to one of those sites, you can select Rule 1466, and it, the site contribution is all automatically designed to meet uh, their rules, right? So as the averages change, two hour, 30 minutes, whether the wind's changing, all the rules that they put in place, the software will accommodate for it. So we actually have people that are renting this that say they don't even understand the rules, but as long as this is approved by them, we'll use it. And they go off of the alerts and that's what they're trusting. Um, we've also built this out to support uh, DER 10 in New York. And then we kind of, the third selection would be kind of an a la carte. Uh, so if you're working on a site, you have parameters and pollutants that you want to set up for this, you can select those and customize it for your site, um, site specific. So um, uh, that's site contribution, a uh, very valuable tool now in the industry as we are really looking to see what's happening and looking at the action and how quickly we can take action on sites. Um, putting that tool right in your pocket. You can set up alerts and everything with that. So I'm gonna turn this over to Connor. He's gonna run through the, uh, the mechanics of it. Howdy folks, my name's Connor. I'm a uh, technical support engineer, or specialist rather, with uh, Aeroqual. Um, so if any of your Aeroqual units run into an issue or you have a warranty problem, I'm the guy you're gonna to talk to. Um, I'm also, I work with uh, the cloud team a lot, so I'm also working with our developers, our research and development team, constantly hand in hand, talking with them all the time. Um, they're all based out of New Zealand, so, you know, there's a little bit of a time gap there, uh, but it, we'll, we'll get you answered regardless. Um, so what is, you know, site contribution, understanding how it came about, what it solves, why does it exist, right? 
Rule 1466, as we've talked about with the South Coast Air Quality uh, Management District out of Los Angeles, they have created this rule to help understand, you know, what is being contributed to the local air around us. Um, the purpose of Rule 1466 is to minimize off-site fugitive dust emissions from earth moving activities, right? Um, at sites containing specific toxic air contaminants, as you guys know. Um, that's Rule 1466 out of Los Angeles. Um, that's where it originated and it's now being adopted as we know here in Chicago. Um, we also have sat hand in hand with the regulators over in New York with the Department of the DEC. Um, and they've developed DER 10, which more specifically deals with PM10 and VOCs uh, simultaneously. Same sort of thing. We want to know the fugitive emissions that are happening uh, from these sites where previously, like they dumped oil in the ground because that's what you did with engine oil at the time, right? So cleaning up these sites, these brown fields, um, and remediating, remediating those sites, big concern with toxic contaminants that are coming out of the ground into the air. Um, there have been a couple of uh, community complaints that have uh, been around these brownfield remediation sites that have um, the consultants that have been working on that site were able to use our air quality and their defensible data that they've been able to create with our air quality monitors to help defend against their claims that these this, you know these guys are emitting so much dust it's hazardous to our health. Well, actually, we've been complying with you know these regulations that are in place to adhere to everything that's going on so it's not actually as toxic as you think it is um, so that helps ease community concerns as Brian touched on previously so what does it solve right provides defensible data like I said also saves you and your team countless hours of charting and data digestion this is the biggest part because Rather than you sitting there with your Excel sheet, going through all of the data, trying to make charts out of it, and do all the calculations that are required, you get an automatically generated report. It's got where your monitors are. It's got uh, also the daily environmental summary. So you've got what was the average temperature for the day? What was the relative humidity? Where was the wind coming from? Where was it going? You also have your minimum PM10 and maximum PM10 uh, contributions, as well as VOCs. Um, and all of that is given with you in nice, easy, generated format that will get delivered to you automatically if you want it. Uh, great report and yeah, collates all that data for you so that you do not have to. We also have automated alerts with this site contribution software where you can set up alerts to um, let you know when you're rising on those 15 minute average uh, for the PM10, right? So the there's that, Remind me again, it was the RAL, the... Reportable action level. Yes, reportable action level. Uh, that was at 150 micrograms per cubic meter. Now, you can set up alerts so that when you get to about 100, you, you're alerted and you can start putting in those uh, remediation tactics to lower the dust levels in that area. Rather than getting to that point where you, you then have to report to the regulators, you can actually take, advantage, take action ahead of time. So, you know, you, you've got prep work to get started a little bit. You gotta make sure you know, you know, where are your units going on site? Are there designated names for each of these locations? You wanna make sure that you know that you're talking about the right air monitor at each of the different locations. Um, you also need to make sure with our cloud software, you gotta get your, get your users enabled. You can also give access to your regulators as well so that they're able to go in at any point in time and see, oh, you know what, I just got an alert about a reportable action limit. We're able to go in there, take a look at that in real time and see, oh, yes, okay, so it happened at this monitor, at this location, and this is what happened, this, these are the levels. Um, so then if they need to go out on site and see where is that, what is, you know, all those other questions that need to be asked and answered, um, they're able to see that right away. Um, and then also, which site contribution type will you guys be using? Um, here in Chicago, with the adherence to Rule 1466, probably going to be using Rule 1466. So, how easy is it to set up? Four steps. You get your contribution, you select your type. You're going to get 1466 out here, and then it's going to give you all of these different things uh, already, and you're going to be able to select your data source options. 
You can also get uh, wind measurement options if you have a MET station on a particular location, uh, or you can just set it to automatic and it'll determine all of that information for you. Um, fairly straightforward, pretty easy to use. Um, and then I've also got the DER10 con site contribution up there as well. And like Brian mentioned, there's also a custom site contribution that you can set up. So you can monitor other things like, you know, the, um, all the other uh, chemicals that they're looking for, uh, methane, ozone, uh, carbon monoxide, any of the NOx. Uh, currently, we only have the ability to do um, PM10 and VOC with the DER10, um, and then a single sensor type with the custom. We are looking into uh, advancing that so you can have multiple sensor types in all in the same contribution. Um, our monitors are capable of having three gas modules and one dust module in it, so that's on the smaller AQS. We have the AQM 65s as well that are capable of handling eight gas modules all simultaneously, um, and that those are thermally controlled as well. So lots of options available for the different air monitors and gases that are going to be used at these sites. So once it's running, what is what does the data look like? What's it giving you? We've got charts that are giving you the rolling averages. These are uh, the average contributions. So these are at 15 minute rolling averages, um, which is you know what you're looking for, right? Um, you can see here we've got PM10 on the left, VOC on the right. I've got your average contribution on the top row and your instantaneous contribution here on the bottom row. So you're able to see the random fluctuations throughout the day. Truck drives by, goes up a little bit. Um, or, you know, a big dust, dirt moving activity happens. You're able to see the PM10 spike there. Um, this is actual real data from a site contribution over in New York. Um, and this is what they've experienced at those times. Um, you're able to see also that there was a spike in VOCs at about, I believe that was like 1130. Um, and so, yeah, it's uh, pretty cool to see all this data coming through. Um, You'll also get all of your wind speed data as well. So this is wind speed in miles per hour, uh, you know, up and down throughout the day, but hovering between one and four miles an hour. Um, you also get data for each location as well. So which one's your downwind, which one's your upwind, um, as well as the VOC and PM10. Easy to read charts, uh, and you're able to tell which way that wind is going and where it's coming from. Uh, the contribution windrows, that's actually included on the report on page two. Um, and you'll, you'll be able to see, you know, uh, <laughs> the speed of which the wind is coming from and where it's coming from so that you can tell, hey, this is the amount of time that the wind is coming from that direction. So we're able to see, okay, the dust is moving this way if, if we do generate dust. Uh, we do have a lot more information as well about site contribution. We've got a blog post on our website. We have a 40 minute webinar if you'd like to uh, go watch that. Um, we have it available on our website. Uh, or we also have support documentation as well on our support site. And if that's not enough for you, you can talk to me in person or, or I'll be happy to meet you on Teams. Um, and we'll, we can answer a lot more questions for you about that. Any one of our team are happy to answer these questions as well. So that's gonna wrap that up. Do you guys have any questions for me or any other things? Yes, sir. Can you integrate that with, um, say we're using a cloud software like VirusSuite, can that be integrated by an API or whatever? So we do have an API available. We can pull data across. Um, I, I'd be happy to work with you on, on uh, understanding your data needs. Um, we, we do have that availability. Um, maybe offline, can you tell, uh, just for the purposes of when we talk to our regulated industry contacts, um, maybe offline, can you say, you know, just exactly how much setting up something like this would cost? You know, I have a guy for you to talk to. His name's Don Allen. He's right there in the back. He'll be able to get you more information about that. Any other questions? What's yes, sir. The, what's the alert method? Is it email? Is it yeah, text? so we have email and text message. We also have a mobile application that we're working on developing push notifications for as well. So these alerts will reach you. 
any other questions for me? I've got about three minutes left, so I might give you some time to relax and grab another coffee. Not yet. Okay. Cool. Thank you for your time, guys. Thank you, Connor. Next up, Volker and Brian. New developments. Just Volker. New developments for special applications. together very early today so um, what I would like to talk about a little bit is, is some special applications not necessarily dust related uh, but you know we at Clean Air we, we use air call equipment throughout for all sorts of applications off the wall applications and so on and a lot of times um, while we're out in the field and applying those you're thinking about oh it would be great if it could if you could do this or could do that and then we typically take that information bring it back to AeroQual and then you have a discussion and see okay sometimes there are easy uh, add-ons available sometimes they're not and then we at Clean Air we just love to, to tinker I mean we're all engineers and scientists at heart and thinking and we, we think well maybe let's have a look at this and work with AeroQual to see whether there's something we, we can bring to the table and we can uh, we can engineer. So one of the things that we have been looking at or have been used quite, have used quite a bit uh, are the total VSC, the PID module, so your error call, I think that's the AQS, it's the AQS1 and at this point it doesn't say dust sentry, so, but uh, one beauty, beauty of the error call equipment is that it measures dust, you can add different modules in there and so it can also be extended to measure VUCs and, and other gas. We'll talk about this a little bit more. And uh, so uh, we have some boxes that say dust sent you on there, but they're used for measuring gases. And some say AQS1, but they're used to measure dust. So uh, quite inter interchangeably. So for this particular application, uh, we take these systems out, run some industrial facilities, we'll measure total VUCs. Typically that's done using a photo ionization detector. I'm not gonna go into details of that detector, but it's it's quite sensitive. It's non-speciating. So if you have benzene, toluene, and certain other compounds coming together in, in an air parcel, you will not be able to say, hey, this is benzene and this is so on. So it's not speciating. However, it gives you a good indication in real time that something's coming across, right? Um, one beauty of this particular one is uh, it, it does not respond to methane and ethane and propane, uh, not a good response factor. And so at times uh, this is very helpful, uh, especially around oil and gas facilities because you don't want to measure methane, what you are interested in might be the other aromatics, for instance, right? Um, so it does respond to a large variety of inorganics. Um, it's quite sensitive to methane. In the lab, I think the published detection limit half PPB, something like this, I think, yeah, yeah. So very, very sensitive to give you um, a reference. If you look at minimal risk levels for non-cancer uh, endpoints for benzene, you're looking at um, an annual MRL, that's how they call it, of nine PPB, is that nine PPB? Or three? Well, you can look this up, you Google MRL. Uh, so it's, it's very, very sensitive. Um, there you go, lower detection limit, one PPB for, uh, if you use isobutylene. So the way, you don't really calibrate these systems, but you want to make sure that they correspond the way you think they would correspond if you typically use isobutylene as a standard, the standard across the industry. So uh, isobutylene, one PPB, if that were to be benzene, about half a PPB in the lab, right? Uh, very special for uh, if the air qual system is that it, it has 
a drift correction mechanism in there. That's a hardware drift correction. You, it's very rare in the industry to find a hardware drift correction. And then there are certainly on top of this, and I'm just looking at Brian to see if he nods or not, uh, possibly another software drift correction uh, algorithm. Yes. Yeah. So uh, takeaway is it corrects drift as much as it can. Remember, this is a small sensor in a non-environmentally controlled enclosure, so there will be drift, but it's minimizing the drift. And it's actively pumped. I had to I put this on because I think it's important because you can actually uh, expose this system to zero and span gases, eyes between and zero air, and bump test it for response. It's not much of a, uh, of a speciation unit. So now, having that said, at times, if there is a plume coming through, you want to, you want to really know what's in that plume. Doesn't is it's great that I see something is coming through, but I want to know maybe from a health perspective is that benzene? Is it something else? And so the typical approach to this is you take a passivated stainless steel canister, SUMA can, which is on the vacuum, you pop the seal open, pull some air in in a very crude way, express, I suppose, and then close it up, send it off for analysis using TU method TU15. So benzene is one, one of them, right? So it uh, would be great if we could automate this, tie this into the PID whenever the PID is reading something high above a certain trigger level. We'll have maybe an add-on that pops that open, takes a graph sample so we can send this off for analysis. And so that's where we typically come in and uh, had some folks look at this and think, mm, let's, let's write a wish list to Santa here, see what, what we really want, what we need and put this together. And that's what we came up with. We have this back there. Maybe we can go through this later, but it's, it's an add-on. We called it the Met SES, Suma Canister Switcher, very original name. So, but uh, it ties it quite well, it does the job. It's powered through the aeroport. You see the two, two lights down there. You see the Suma can down there. The bottom is a 1.4 liter can. And what it does, it requires the Connect API on your system to be activated and you, you ping that API, the system once a minute because this, the aeroport unit generates a drift corrected value once a minute. Once that value is above a certain trigger level, it pops the can open for a set number of minutes. We'll put in there 5, 15, 30, 60. It's a grab sample, right? That's really what you're after, not 24 hours. And um, there is a vacuum sensor in there. so. One thing you do not want to do with SUMA cans, you don't want to run out the vacuum. You always want to have a little bit of residual vacuum in there, otherwise it would be difficult or impossible to, to analyze this. So there's a vacuum sensor in there, so there's a protection from oversampling. And the vacuum reading is kind of fed back into the air wall, kind of because it's a voltage that's being fed in, and which makes it then to the cloud where you can set an alarm around that vacuum voltage. If the vacuum changes, it sends you an email saying, hey, your canister starts to sample. It's just a way to get around. Um, you really want to make sure that certain things are being fed into the AeroCore cloud. Uh, the way this design looks like this, just a few things to point out. Everything is silk treated steel, maybe the high road, but um, we'll decide we, we go this route, including a little frit, stainless steel frit. Um, a latch valve, so you don't have much, you don't need much power there. Vacuum sensor, nice thing there is a has a diaphragm that's a 316 stainless steel, so everything is quite alert. Uh, the OLED display, quite bright, switches off on its own, it allows you to type in all the durations and so on. So we can we can show that a little bit later, perhaps. Uh, accommodates all sorts of canisters, 1.4 liters, small ones as well as the six liters. And uh, it's connected through a swage lock. The first version, we had these nifty quick connects. They were great. But if this actually uh, flops back and forth with, with wind, for instance, these quick connects tend to turn loose and that's not good. So we'll go back to the good old swage lock fitting, give it a nice little nudge and it's tight. All right, so that is that. Another one, um, we talked, I think Brian mentioned it earlier that the AQM65 has an automated calibration module that, uh, where, where 
works very well for the AQM65 um, to allow you to calibrate with multi-point calibrations um, of the AQM65 and you can actually schedule the calibrations or the bump checks through the AirCore software. Unfortunately, that is not available for the AQS1, which is one unit that we use over and over and over again. That's like our workhorse. Um, and we, we rent it out uh, quite a bit. So again, uh, went back to the drawing board and Dawn can probably talk about this all day, but we'll keep it brief and uh, figured, okay, how, what can we do to allow our clients to have a bump test done and a zero test as well, uh, not so much to calibrate, but to provide, because for calibration, you would have to go on site and do, to do, uh, do some changes, but to give you an idea how your signal drifts and so on. And so um, we provided, well, that's the enclosure, but it ties onto the AQS-1 and you schedule in the enclosure with a similar keypad and interface that you have seen the time when you want this calibrated or bump tested. Um, what time, I guess even the repetition every day or so on and how long, and then it, it does its thing. So there's a timer on board, uh, a real-time clock, battery-backed real-time clock that initiates the bump test for certain durations every day or whenever you choose to do this. Um, and that, of course, feeds then back into the cloud because you can see your, your concentration changes and gives you a good idea. Even if you're not there, remotely you can assess how well does the system perform. Do I have to go on site, change something out? Uh, for PID sensors, for instance, they have a little, little, uh, they have a little lab inside that wears out after about six months, maybe a year, you have to change those lamps out. So that will get you that trend information remotely. Uh, another new product uh, that is now available through Aeroqual is a methane sensor. And I'll put this out here. So we, a couple years ago, and um, I want to preface this with this because this is, this is not an Aeroqual sensor there. I just wanted to show here this, you know, these sensors that are out there, the small sensors that are being used for methane detection. Um, are sensors that you can that you have in your smoke alarm, so metal oxide sensors. That's something we put together about five six years ago when they first were published on, and uh, ran some tests and like ah this actually turns into into work, and so we kind of worked away walked away from this. And about a year or two ago, you guys started looking into this very heavily, and I'm glad you did. Uh, and this is now available. Um, and in a, in a nice package, again, this is the AQS-1 here, you can have a PID in there, you can measure PM10, and then you can squeeze another methane sensor in there if you speak, and it's drift corrected and so on. And perhaps some, some few notes to, to the small sensors. These small sensors, again, not speciating, they measure methane, they also mock sensors, they measure carbon monoxide to respond to methanol, I believe, and a whole slew of other things, right? Um, so, but they respond to methane, right? So, uh, the, and I think the range is, is that correct? Zero to 100. Zero to 100 ppm, so, okay. Uh, precision, about half a ppm, maybe, maybe half a ppm, ppm to one ppm. So, uh, we'll put this on a roof, had to run that side by side, so we'll, when we received that model, we thought, okay, what can we do to ascertain how well that operates? Because these mock sensors, if you ever used them before, they actually have a larger change, a larger response to changes in temperature and humidity than to methane. And so Eric Paul went way out of its way to develop an algorithm to uh, mitigate all those changes. Think about it. We figured, okay, what we want to do is, we'll do a side-by-side -side test uh, on the roof. This one here will use a reference monitor, not federal, federal reference method is for criteria pollutants, but we use a Picaro unit. Uh, they don't make those anymore, but we actually bought the last two and they're available for rent. Quite nice, come in the backpack form. They are uh, cavity ring dot spectroscopy monitors that matter, measure methane and ethane. So we'll put them side by side. Uh, they have a larger range and a very, very high precision. And here's what we came up with. So the test was, put it up on the roof, 
run this for a month to turn it into um, actually turned more like two months. We went a little bit farther out in January. Then we took it, put it out in, a, uh, in an industrial environment, and we brought it back. So what I can share is the one that we measured on the roof. Overall looks looks good. You see changes there. If you blow this up, it's quite interesting. Uh, they do track each other. One is an instrument with a PPB level response, the other one with half a PPM or one PPM. So I found that fascinating. Uh, well, it turns out, as a boiler vent, and what you would expect, uh, even in your res residential boilers, you know, when, whenever the boiler comes on, it kicks on the valve, puts in natural gas, which some of it get puffed out before it ignites. I mean, it's just how these things work, right? This was quite cold, so you can see it come then on quite often. So, uh, what that allowed us to do, kind of blessing in disguise, is that we plotted them side by side, the month month worth of data, average to five minutes, and it it looked quite. I was quite surprised um, to see something like this. To be honest, what you can see though is perhaps just do it down here for instance is that real perhaps not um, again you know, I'm sorry Ugh. all right so what I wanted to show here is that you can see see this here for instance, so gray, gray is the Picaro, red is the air qual. You, you, you do see occasions where something like this, again, it's a non-speciating sensor, responds to a lot of different things. There could be interferences. That's just what it says. But overall, it performed quite well. You see diurnal cycles here and, and so on. Um, sometimes some interferences. We didn't look at actually what this is. I, might, I would speculate sometimes there might be some, something coming across, maybe CO2, uh, possibly. All right, so that's available, and yeah, that's it. Questions? I just want to say, Tom, and thank you for presenting on all that today. Uh, that uh, last graph you showed was looks like December 2022, um, and so we still, I think we recently just rolled that sensor out that's uh, seen in the market uh, within the last couple months. So between then and the last couple months, we've had these. So we never have paired them, but we have used hydrogen sulfide sensors. Um, they, they work, they have drift like everything else, but they can be used for training purposes. Um, I think from a spec perspective, you prefer to have them in an environmentally controlled AQM65. Yes, but we'll, we'll It's, so um, if, if you look at the, um, the order threshold for H2S is somewhere in the 10 ppb range, even less at times. Um, certain states regulate this. I think PA actually has an H2S limit. It's an annual limit. Um, Canada has a, I think towards the tar sand region up there, they have six ppb limits. Uh, I believe, I'm, I'm not 100% sure on this. You may want to check this out. but. What I'm saying there is, it's very, very low concentrations where you start smelling this. Uh, to put this in perspective, for these H2S sensors, the drift in an air-conditioned AQM, where you, you limit the drift, uh, is plus minus 20 ppb, right? So, and that is low. If you look at precision measurements of H2S, laser-based measurements, you're talking detection limits of one ppb, two, three ppb. So, I mean, 
compare this to these low cost sensors, that, that is quite fantastic. But you've got to keep this in mind, putting it in perspective for your application, you're looking at deviations above a certain threshold, order threshold, which is already very low. And so it can be used, certainly when you're closer to the source, that makes more sense. Um, you can also go with a more dedicated, high-powered monitor, so it's, it's certainly that. At the end of the day, um, that's a good approach for screening. You can use those H2S electrochemical cell sensors. Um, sometimes when you smell something, you may want to pop a Suma can open if you really want to know what's in there. Um, not always it's H2S. There are other compounds that have a much, much lower order threshold. Um, yeah, well, I think order monitoring is not necessarily an exact, well, I shouldn't say that. Uh, probably a lot of people out there telling me that it isn't exact science, but it's, it's, it's a lot, it's, yeah, it's, it's a science. It's, and it requires a lot of um, evaluations so on. Yeah. Yes, I guess what I'm saying is that there's not one tool that fits all, so that's what I'm saying. That the uh, the suma canister switcher thing, I'm a little I'm a little confused about that. So you're you're collecting the sample in a suma canister, and it, it can pop open if it sees a, uh, a thing. But then are you, you're taking the suma canister to a lab yep. to be okay. So what? Why would you use that rather than like a micro GC uh, that you know could operate continuously and do on-site speciation? What what circumstances would you prefer to be using Suma Caster? So the the micro GCs typically are limited to a handful of compounds, ETEX. Uh, sometimes it's useful to have some metadata around this. Is is are there is there maybe beta dyne in there? Um, are there other markers that point towards a certain source versus another? use a suma can you can get an analysis of up to I mean if you talk to the lab typically you can get maybe 60 compounds you can add even more in if you like to so it's really a matter of uh, do I look for a certain set of compounds is it beneficial to broaden that analysis out a little bit more uh, to do maybe source profiling or do I look at Am I confident that maybe there is another risk driver in there that's outside of the set of what the micro GCs can provide? Okay. Next. Hey, speaking about micro GCs, how robust are they in terms of exposure to outside conditions? Like so there, there are quite a number of micro GCs out there. Uh, the micro GC that that uh, Aeroqual provides is actually is actually in an air environmentally controlled enclosure, the AQM65. I think uh, there was a lot of work done by, by Aeroqual to look exactly at that. How, how much do environmental changes um, impact drift? And I think the thought process was, if you want to get the same detection limits that you enjoy in the lab, which I wish I could show that graph, but we did some work and uh, it's in a one to two ppb range, potentially less. Um, you have to put it behind some environmentally controlled or into the environmentally controlled enclosure. Yeah. Now, that will increase the power footprint that is required and so on. Is that right? I mean, Lauren, you have more experience with those systems than I do. The BTEX micro GCs, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I, that company they work real well. They, they, they run through and they just run, of course, the basic BTEX things if you're looking for more chemical. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Volker. Last up for this morning, we have Don and Connor discussing the top 10 support questions. Some questions just 
your basic questions that people kind of run through that we get now and then. Uh, they're obviously more difficult questions to answer. Uh, anything that you may end up with in the future if you buy or rent an item from us, you would kind of want to direct all those questions to clean air as much as possible. We can get through about 90% of those, maybe even 95 on a good day. And then when we have a bad day, I call Connor. And Connor and I, um, recently working with a BTEX unit, you know, we've got online, we team viewered in, we were able to go into the background, set everything up, make sure the thing was working perfectly, work with the client, where the client ran gases to it. And we ran through, and we were able to get a good calibration out of the unit, and it's been running pretty consistently at this point in time. So, you know, so there is a lot of background help we can give you. It isn't just you're getting this instrument and now you're on your own. So we want to make sure everyone really understands that. So we rent and sell their products. So when, we, when things come through, direct questions to us, we'll work with them. They do have a great online submission form that you can get to and you can just send them a text here and there if you want to go direct but the idea is, is to really kind of contact us if you can up front so um, some of the common common technical questions we run through modules calibration hot swaps how do we get a solar setup correctly duplicates this and that we'll run through all these real quick um, I know everyone's hungry uh, so we're gonna try to be fast lunch is Kind of the next stop. I'm actually going to let Connor talk about these ones. Sure. These, these are all kind of the new modules they've come out with and kind of the reason why we threw this in here, sorry Connor, that's okay, I'm going to go, is because when the AQS-1 first came out it didn't come with as many sensors as it does now. So they've been adding sensors as things go along. So Yeah, so uh, we have quite a few modules uh, that are available with our AQS system. We have even more that are available with our eight larger AQM65 system. Um, some of these modules, like the methane and the hydrogen sulfide and the, and the sulfur dioxide, have built-in scrubbers and humidification, um, uh, like desiccant, built into them. So that way we're getting just pure gas readings. Um, there are some cross-sensitivities cross that we've tried to mitigate as much as possible, especially with methane. Um, we've found that it was like it was reactive to one of the most common uh, elements. I forget which, exactly which one uh, right off the top of my head, but um, they, they have uh, all sorts of technology built into them. Uh, a lot of it's proprietary that I can't tell you about. <laughs> Uh, but that's the, the larger modules that you see down there in the bottom. Um, those ones are the ones that have those scrubbers built into them. VOC module. This is kind of maybe my favorite module of the uh, of the Aeroqual products because it is dynamite. I found the zero drift on it, and uh, and when we're running it, is near really zero. I'm being told I have to move left. Sorry. Um, but uh, it, it, it goes through like a 60 second cycle where it zeroes for 30 seconds, it gives you a reading for 30 seconds, it has an internal scrubber, and then it pops out a reading at the end and an auto zero, so you maintain that zero real well. Um, one of the issues though is, is you gotta know that that thing's running all the time, and how do you know it's running? And we have found, or at least our belief at, at Clean Air is, is you really gotta test that thing and make sure that it is really working on a regular basis and that's part of the reason why we came out with the bump test unit that, that uh, Volker was talking about that unit can actually go through you can use her to find your zero gas you can use her to find your calibration gas and you can run it at daily every other day every third day every week however often you want to run that test gas so that you can continue to get the most out of your gas cylinder but still be confident your units working also within the air quality software there's a couple there's a spot where they measure some bias voltages and those bias voltages need to be up over, I think it's 50 millivolts, 50 millivolts or so. If you run below 50 millivolts, they start to become very like this, and it's suggested to change them out. It's time for to rebuild, this, rebuild the module itself. And it is a module that they do support products for to be rebuilt. You can get a new lamp, you can get a new um, stack board for it, replace all that, and they run pretty much like new after that. So you generally get about, from what we found, is about nine months out of them. Is that correct? Uh, we, we recommend a year. Do you recommend a year? Yeah, a year. I know Volker said six, nine year. It's a, you know, I think it all really depends on kind of the, how often you're running it and what kind of conditions they're in. 
Sure. Um, the Nephilometer does have a built-in auto zero function. We actually just introduced a uh, software bit where in the Nephilometer uh, dust entries or AQS, um, after about five minutes of letting the, the system warm up, it'll do an auto zero and it'll perform, uh, essentially it uh, does a backflow through the, uh, through the Nephilometer so that it can uh, grab an actual zero with the Nephilometer. It'll do a whole bunch of math in the back end and figure out, oh yep, okay, so here's, here's baseline, this is zero. Um, and it'll do that automatically. We generally, generally have it set for every 24 hours of runtime. Um, if you turn the unit off, it does reset that timer. So if you have a, a need for, you know, you're taking the unit out to site, you turn it on, let it run for five minutes, it's gonna do the auto zero, you run it for eight hours, take it down at the end of the day. Um, you can set that auto zero to happen a little more often than 24 hours of runtime. These things are built to run 24 seven, 365. Um, so we do have that, um, that in mind with these things running. Uh, and there's a, a, a diagnostics field in cloud that you're actually able to change these values live online that's part of the wonderfulness of the two-way communication and having a modem in the AQS themselves. Done. We'll see what we get next year. Um, oh, one of the things that, that uh, one of the things that we run into now and then, we put people out there when you get your error call systems, you kind of become your company administrator and you control everything. You can set up new sites, this um, new locations. Uh, the uh, uh, contribution website, all of that, those are things that are fully under your control. One of the things we run into now and then is say you rented a unit from me and then you go to add your email address into their system as a username. You'll come up with this error that says, hey, that email already exists. They got a security system in place right now where they wanna make sure there's only one unique email address per person in the system. We found the best way is to create another unit another email for yourself and use that as a secondary user. There are ways in the background where they can probably make those changes, but I don't know if that's always the best idea because you might just run into that issue again at one point in time. I would like to add that we are actually working on a solution for multiple users in multiple sites and organizations. It's coming, we're working on it, and not this year maybe, but next year. So, Yes, soon. I've been asking for that for a while, so it's one of those things. Uh, calibration gases. Um, we have a, a list of recommended calibration gases that we have for each of our different modules. Um, for the, the gas used for calibration for ozone, it's obviously ozone, right? You want to make sure that you're calibrating against what you know. Um, for VOC, we recommend isobutylene. Um, and uh, every other gas is all calibratable, calibratable against itself. Um, it, it, there's various methods of hooking it up. We sell an AirCal 1000, which you'll see upstairs later. Um, it will automatically mix that gas for you, so long as you know the concentration and you do a little bit of math ahead of time. It'll it'll make that concentration and deliver it across the uh, sensor for you. Uh, so we do make that. Uh, it, it's all fairly straightforward in regards to calibration. So. Uh, this is actually those modules. That's an AirCal 1000, um, and we also uh, sell the ozone calibration as well um, that will generate ozone for you so that you have a known quantity of ozone uh, as well. Um, the next one, uh, I'll, I'll talk about it. Uh, <laughs> it's the AirQual recommended factory, factory calibration of sensor heads. Uh, so this is actually hot swap. Our, our, we recently introduced a hot swap program where we did away with factory calibration because we found that the customer experience was poor. Um, we used to send sensor heads and sensor modules back to New Zealand, um, all the way to New Zealand <laughs> for sensor calibration. Uh, but we found that uh, it was a 30 to 45 business day turnaround. So you're looking at a month of downtime when you don't have a sensor. So that, would, that sucks, right? Nobody wants that. So what we did is we introduced the hot swap program where now it's, instead of a 30 to 45 business day turnaround, 
you let us know the serial number, and as long as it's within the certain window, uh, 10 to 14 months for a sensor head, and um, 20 to 28 months for uh, one of our AQS modules, um, as long as it's within that range, we'll, be, we'll, we'll say, yep, it's, it's a hot swap ready available, and we'll just drop ship you a new sensor. It takes about three days to ship from New Zealand. There you go. You don't have a month downtime. You have the, literally the, the time that it takes to swap out a module, which is like 10 to 20 minutes. Um, that covers that one. And then I'll let you talk about battery stuff. Gotcha. Um, we had a lot of people that asked about solar systems because they, that's one of the nice things about the AQS ones and the dust centuries. They will run real well on solar systems. They generally run at about uh, 30 watts per hour. And when you're sizing out your battery, you come up with about two and a half amp hours is where that's at. And if you just do basic multiplication, 24 hours at two and a half amp hours, you're looking at a 60 amp battery that'll run you 24 hours. And that's usually if we have people that rent these batteries from us. So we'll send those out and, and you just swap them, swap them out daily. Um, the 30 amp hour or the 30 watts that I put in there is kind of on the high end. We see more like 25 to 27, but we want to be safe so you get a full 24 hours in there. Um, we ran through there, started talking about solar systems. We try to size our solar system so they'll run a full four days with no sun because we really don't want things to die on you. And, and it's taken a little trial and error to get there. When you calculate it out, you need a kind of the minimum of 240 amp hours to make that time frame. We generally send our systems out about with about 400 amp hours of battery. We also send out 400 watt solar panels with those, and we found for most of North America, this works pretty well. We haven't had too many problems. Once in a great while, snowstorm, whatever, we have things kind of die out. But it usually takes, you know, we get four days out of that, and if things melt off, we start getting sun again. Everything comes back up and running on its own. Uh, that's the last slide I have. Any technical questions you may have for Connor or myself while we're up here? Volker. Hey, what type of batteries do you use? Oh man, they're called life lithium ion phosphate or something. They're life ion phosphates. They're super light compared to like the lead acids. I mean, you're talking about one quarter of the weight. If you go to the, um, uh, if you're going to be in the hands-on sessions, we'll have some of them up there that you can take a look at. I'm going to run them off of those batteries for just ease of use, realistically, and we can show them to you how they work. Have you seen any degradation of performance when it's pre-cooled? Oh, yeah. yeah. There, there, there becomes a point, I think it's actually like negative 10 or so, where they don't want to charge anymore. So it becomes, we try to, we look at where things are going prior to really sourcing out those batteries. Uh, one comment I have is uh, when you use the air port image, the, the weather station, some of these weather stations are hidden. They sound, they sound a weather station, I think it's a hidden weather station. Okay. Yeah. We don't have any of those. Okay. You do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. But yeah, that's something to take in consideration, and we, we would look at that. There are a couple of new other stations we're looking into that are on the horizon, yeah. um, and uh, we can talk about that upstairs maybe. So, any other things? Okay, okay, thank you, Connor, appreciate it. Thank you all for being here, and I guess we'll adjourn for lunch. Thank you. <laughs>
and then you'll make a right. So the opposite direction from the bathrooms and the front, the, the, uh, front doors. Let's go the other direction, you'll find our uh, lunchroom over there. And lunch will be served in about 13 minutes. Thank you. Should we take our stuff with us? We're not coming back down here? Uh, we are not coming back down. Okay. If you need to leave anything down here, uh, you 